Good afternoon. I am Nikki Jones, professor and H. Michael and Jeannie Williams, department chair of African American Studies. And I am thrilled to welcome you to our sixth and final panel of this year's series, Critical Conversations, Catching Up with June, a conversation on Black childhoods. Although we meet in virtual space, let us begin with the acknowledgement that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of Huchun, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chotenyo speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the sovereign Verona band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Moekwa Ohlone tribe and other familiar descendants of the Verona band. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. Consistent with our values of, of community, inclusion, and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. As members of the Berkeley community, it is vitally important that we not only recognize the history of the land on which we stand, but also that the Muwekma Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader, area, broader Bay Area communities today. And thanks, as always, to UC Berkeley Centers for Educational Justice and Community Engagement, the Native American Student Development Office for crafting this acknowledgement. Today's panel, Black Childhoods, is, as I said at the top, the sixth and final install installment in our year-long celebration of the life and legacy of writer, activist, and longtime UC Berkeley faculty member, June Jordan. Building on our successful spring 2021 se series celebrating Dr. Barbara Christian and exploring the concept of abolition democracy, our Critical Conversation series continues to ask, what are the lessons of, of the Black feminist, Black radical, and Black intellectual traditions for our moment? And what is the role of Black studies in building more just futures? The Critical Conversation series is supported by the Abolition Democracy Initiative, a three-year department initiative that began in fall 2020 with the goal of centering and responding to the most pressing questions of the moment. Questions that were perhaps new to some, but that we understood as enduring questions about Black freedom and the ongoing project of, ab of abolition. Inspired by the work of W.B. Du Bois, Angela Davis, and others writing in the abolition, abolitionist tradition, the initiative amplifies the work of academics, activists, artists, and poets, as we've seen uh, over the last two panels in particular, who are actively imagining and building a world beyond policing and prisons. As we close out our year of programming, I'd like to thank the people who have supported this series, including Chancellor Carol Crisp, Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost Kathy Koshlin, Vice Provost for Faculty, Ben Hermelin, and the Dean of the Division of Social Sciences, Rocker Ray. I wanna acknowledge and thank the members of the ADI leadership team, Professors Lee Rayford, Eula Taylor, and Tiana Paschel for the leadership and vision that created the Abolition Democracy Initiative. I also wanna give a special shout out and thanks to my colleague, Professor Lee Rayford, who moderated the first two panels of the year, A Place of Rage, June Jordan and Her Circle, and Skyrise, June Jordan's Architectural Ima Imaginary. Lee is also the co-PI with Tiana Paschel, an inaugural director of the Mellon-funded Black Studies Collaboratory, which has hosted an outstanding set of talks, performances, and panels this semester. Uh, there are, are remaining events, and you can find recording, recordings of those events and information on future events on the Black Studies Collaboratory website. I also want to offer my deep thanks to Professor Chayuma Elliott, a generous colleague and mentor in the department who is also a panelist today. Chai curated the three events that round out our series this semester, beginning with learning from June Jordan, a, a poetry for the people conversation and black writers in the Bay. And finally, today's conversation. Those videos are all available on our department's YouTube site. Uh, today's event is also being recorded. A live uh, transcript is being generated. Uh, and this conversation will, will also be uh, posted on our YouTube site. I wanna thank Rachel Anspach, a doctoral candidate in our department who has her hands full with this and other projects uh, for all of her work over the years. She's done an amazing job of leading the administrative and logistical efforts required to put on events like this one. Uh, thanks as well to Kiana Pajaro, who has done a wonderful job assisting Rachel this semester uh, and Maria Herrera Dia for her assistance last semester. Thank you to our colleagues at ETS for supporting the webinar for today's event. I also want to thank Adrian Torf for her messages of encouragement and support over the year. It's meant so much to us and to all of you who have sent messages in the chat or via email on the Critical Conversation series. We appreciate you. Finally, our deep thanks to our panelists for today and throughout the year. And thanks to all of you who are watching this conversation live or on a recording uh, for joining us today. And now let's turn to the panel, Black Childhoods a fitting ending to this year's series. 
Today's panel weaves together themes of Jordan's work that have emerged throughout each of our conversations this year. Themes that reflect qualities that are often associated with childhood, imagination, curiosity, and creativity to be sure, but also vulnerability, determination, a fine-tuned sense of right and wrong, and joy and laughter. We've heard so often about Jordan's laughter and her openness and invitation, and maybe even insistence to play, to play with words, ideas, one another, and in our own minds. We've also learned from June Jordan in our conversations and meditations on her life and work that childhood isn't child's play. At the heart of it all is a serious question, a question that Jordan wants, demands that we take seriously. What would it take to build a world in which a Black child is safe, truly seen, free, and free to love? A world where, as Jordan asks us, love is an easy response. And what is our role in this process of creation? As we move into a period of retrenchment with calls for a racial reckoning seemingly displaced by promises and demands to invest in so-called systems of security and safety, systems that make many of us unsafe, we are reminded of how important this work is, especially in the in-between times. I know our panelists today will help us to consider these questions and more. I hope that you join the conversation as well. I invite you to submit questions through the Q&A feature. Uh, we'll reserve the chat window for shout outs and appreciations. Um, and let me now turn to introducing our co-moderator for today's event, Rila Violet Botts Ward. Hey. <laughs> Ree will share some introductory comments and a reading from June Jordan's work before introducing our panelists for today. We'll then turn to readings from each of our guests. Rila Violet Botts Ward is a homegirl, an artist, and a non traditional community curator from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Currently a doctoral candidate in African diaspora studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Her research explores Black women's healing spaces in Oakland as sites of radical self making and spiritual reclamation. As founder of Black Women Healing, recurates healing circles, exhibitions, courses, and research for and by Black women. She remains invested in making her academic work accessible to community audiences, using art and poetry as tools to translation. Her first book, Mourning My Inner Black Girl Child, published in 2021, uses poetics as practice to explore ancestral grief work, spiritual gifts, and embodied modes of diasporic healing. Her work has been supported by the UC Berkeley Arts Research Center, the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation, and the Alliance for the Arts and Research Universities, among others. And for more on Ree's work, you can visit our website, Black Women Healing, W O, -O M X N Healing uh, com, and we'll put that in the chat as well. You can visit her on Instagram. So I now turn it to you, Ree. Thank you. Peace family, thank you so much, Nikki. Um, I'm so honored to be here. I first wanna thank June Jordan, um, our beloved ancestor for her labors of love um, and just invite her into this space. I want to begin um, with a reading from one of my favorite works of June Jordan's Soldier, A Poet's Childhood, um, where she talks about her relationship to what I consider her inner Black girl child, right? Her younger self, the Black girl who she was, who laid the foundation for the June Jordan that we know and love and celebrate today. This is from the first few pages of the text. She says, I was born on the hottest day in Harlem. A beastly heat set records while my mother labored more than 25 hours alone inside a shuttered hospital room. No one gave her anesthesia or any other comfort. The staff kept my father waiting beyond the closed doors. And stunned by her incessant weeping, her repetitive weeping petitions to the Lord for some relief, he could scarcely decide whether to sit, to stand, or to smash up a chair, a pane of glass, a coffee cup. My mother continued to moan and she begged God to forgive her for those outbursts of ingratitude. She was being blessed with a child months before she had been visited in her sleep by angels who had told her that this firstborn would prove to be a great help to her people, colored people. She was being blessed. 
and I skip ahead a few pages where she talks about her father. She says, he was a race man, an admirer of Marcus Garvey, an enthusiast for theories about African origins of the human species, a zealous volunteer boxing instructor at the Harlem YMCA, devoted literature in the available Negro poetry, and political writings. And also he would angrily insist that he was not black, not a Negro. Looking at him, you'd have to say that my father was extremely handsome, possibly white and at least 50% Chinese. Listening to him, you'd have to conclude that he was passionately confused and volatile. Calling himself the little bull, my father was short, conspicuously fit, truthful and generally with women flirtatious, believing that idleness is the devil's plan. He stayed busy reading through the night, his index finger tracking each syllable that he silently mouthed or writing letters to government officials or designing the next household or backyard project or refining a schedule of forced enlightenment for me, his only child. He was forever loquacious, argumentative and visionary in his perspective. And he was addicted to beauty, which is probably why he married my mother. She had flawless brown skin and enormous dark brown eyes. She was very beautiful. She was also very sad. But my father mistook her sadness for dignity and he treasured her reserve, her hesitant pacing, her mysterious poise. He also savored the teasing of her artificial quiet, the fullness of her bosom and her quivering lower lip. She walked that proud Jamaican walk, allowing for no haste, no misstep, no, no embarrassment of clumsy impulse. He was a man's man. She was a man's woman, thrilled to be chosen by an unemployed, ambitious West Indian who would make her his wife. He would be the stubborn provider who would take proper care of her in this strange, fast talking city. I love this passage so much because June invites us into her parents, right? When we talk about Black childhoods, we can't not talk about Black parenthood and what her mother and father tried to create for herself and for her world. And I appreciate how she invites us to think about the predicament of our Black parents, how her mother was treated in labor, what her father struggled to create for them. And I'm so grateful for this passage as it's helped me with my own relationship to telling the stories of my own Black childhood. And with that, I will introduce our wonderful panelists, y'all. I have the distinct honor of calling Chayuma Elliott my dissertation chair. So I'll read her formal bio, but I will also say that Chai has been a fierce advocate for my work, a fierce advocate for so many students in our department. She has celebrated us, honored our creativity, and made room for us to grow in our own voices. So we thank you, Chai. Now for the formal bio, <laughs> Chayuma Elliott is an assistant professor of African American studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Her scholarly work focuses on poetry and the Harlem Renaissance. A former Stegner fellow, Chayuma's poems have appeared in the African American Review, Callaloo, the Notre Dame Review, the P. In review and other journals. She has received fellowships from the American Philosophical Society, Cave Canem, and the Vermont Studio Center. She is the author of four books of poetry, Blue and Green 2021, At Most 2020, Vigil 2017, and California Winter League 2015. She is currently teaching a poetry workshop titled Clifton Jordan Lord as part of the African American Studies Department's year-long celebration of June Jordan's life and legacy. Welcome, Chai. 
I also have the distinct honor of introducing my Poetry Philly fam, Joshua Bennett, who when I was in eighth grade, I watched him as a freshman at UPenn perform at the Rotunda in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And he was a beloved poetry mentor of mine as a little black girl aspiring to find new ways to share my voice and my story. So thank you for all the ways you've modeled that. I'm so proud of you and honored to be introducing you today. So for the formal bio, Joshua Bennett is a professor of English and creative writing at Dartmouth. He is the author of four books of poetry and criticism, The Sobbing School, Penguin 2016, winner of the National Poetry Series, and a finalist for an NAACP Image Award, Being Property Wants My Self, Harvard University Press 2020, winner of the MLA's William Sanders Scarborough Prize, Old Penguin 2022, and The Study of Human Life, Penguin 2022. In 2021, he received the Guggenheim Fellowship and a winning award for poetry and nonfiction. Dr. Bennett earned his PhD in English from Princeton University and an MA in theater and performance studies from the University of Warwick, where he was a Marshall Scholar. He was recited his I'm sorry, he has recited his original works at the Sundance Film Festival, the NAACP Image Awards, and President Obama's Evening of Poetry and Music at the White House. He has also performed and taught creative writing workshops at hundreds of middle schools, high schools, colleges, and universities across the United States, as well as in the UK and South Africa. For his creative writing and scholarship, Joshua has received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, MIT, the Ford Foundation, and the Society of Fellows at Harvard University. His work has been published in The Best American Poetry, The New York Times, The Paris Review, The Yale Review, and elsewhere. Alongside his friend and colleague, Jesse McCarthy, he is the founding editor of Minor Notes, a Penguin classics book series dedicated to minor poets within the Black expressive tradition. He lives in Boston. Welcome, Joshua. Welcome, Chai. We're so excited to receive y'all's poetry. My goodness. Thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. Thank you, Chai, and the entire department for the invitation. My uh, my son's godfather was trained in this department, uh, so I know that y'all are rooted not just in rigor, but in love, um, and it's an honor and a pleasure to be here to share my work with you all, especially on the theme of Black childhood. This is the cover of my most recent book. That's me and my daddy in 1992. I'm eating what looks like cornbread, collard greens, and that chicken off of his plate, so my mom did her thing. She also took this photograph, which means that Penguin had to cut her a check, which is great. Poetry should always be a family business, I think, if possible. So I actually start with a poem that I wrote as a teenager uh, and didn't have the language for until the first time I went on the job market. So this is a token sings the blues. You always are almost always only one in the room, maybe two. Three is a crowd. Three is a gang. Three is a company of thieves. Three is, wow, there's so many of you. Three will get you confused with people that look nothing like you. You get called Devin or Sheila. Your name isn't Devin or Sheila. You do your best not to ignore such casual erasure. You know silence will be received as affirmation, praise even, and you always affirmative. You affirmative action, action figure. You fantastic, first black friend. You first ballot, quota keeper. You almost cry when your history professor says, you know, in this country, the gold standard used to be people. Funny how no one comes right out and says things like you people anymore. It's all cold words like thug or diversity higher. You diversity all by yourself. You contain multitudes and are yet contained everywhere you go, confined like there is always someone watching you and isn't there. And isn't that the entire point of this flesh you inherited, this unrepentant stain. Be twice as good, mama says. 
as if what they have is worth your panic, worth measuring your very life against. And you always remember to measure your hair, your volume, your tone over email. You perpetually sorry. You don't know why. You apologize to no one in particular just for being around and in your body at the same time. You know your body is the real problem. You monster, you beast of burden, you beast and burden, you horse but human, you centaur. You map the stars and pull back your bow to shoot the moon in its one good white eye. You are brilliant. You are beautiful. You are enough. You are everything your big sister says. And on your best days above ground, you believe her. Thank y'all. I'm in my office in my rolly chair, so I might move around a little bit, but I'm not levitating, I assure you. Not yet, at least. I'm talking about June, so who knows? I might just take flight while I'm in here. Uh, and speaking of June, my goodness, who has done more for me at the level of inspiration than one uh, than June Jordan? It's hard to say. Um, her father also worked for the post office, so that's one connection between us. Uh, he also taught her how to box, and uh, my big sister taught me how to box. So this next poem is about that, and it's uh, called Ode, O-W-E-D, to pedagogy. And it's for 1995. Shout out to all my late 80s babies out there. It was the dead center of summer and anyone but us would have been outside hours ago, flailing like a system of larks against the hydrant's icy spray. But a girl had her orders and to disobey our mother was in a sense to invite one's own destruction, cause to pray that a God of mercy might strike first. So we lay still as stars on the living room floor, pouring over formulae, divisors and dividends, quotient, the first synonym for resolution I ever learned and would later come to love for its sound alone. How it reminded me even then of words like quantum in quotation mark, both ways of saying nothing means what you think it means all the time. The observable universe hides behind its smooth obsidian dress and all we can do is grasp at it in myths and figures, see what sticks, give all our best language to the void. What dark irony, these coy child philosophers theorizing how things break from the floor of a house where everything is more or less in flux, indeterminate as the color of the blood in a body or the speed at which I learned to obliterate the distance between myself and any given boy on the block, the optimal angle of the swing most likely to drop another kid cold in front of his crew, to square up, square off, and this too was a kind of education, the way my sister held both fists semi-adjacent, each an inch or so from her switchblade eyes, showed me the stance you take when the math doesn't quite shake out, so it's just you and the unknowns, and the unknowns never win. All right, one or two more from, uh, from Ode. And then we'll get to my new book, The Study of Human Life, uh, which if you know your June, you know is a phrase of hers. So I'll talk a little bit about that later. Barber song. Postmodern Blackness Blacksmith. Straight razor reshaping self-esteem. You dream in geometries unreachable by any other means. Speak an entire phrase's abandoned standard American etymology, hence. You liberate waves from the sea, corn rows from the cornfield, reclaim fade, so I now hear the word and imagine only abundance. Caesar never meant anything to me, but a cut so close you could see the shimmer of a man's thinking. You are how we first learned to bend language built to unmake us, except in plausible risk. Some much older man, shaver in hand like a baton full of wasp gossip, asking with the grain or against. And the question feels damn near existential. 
given this is the only place we can live in such thoughtless proximity to another person's open hands be held by the face ask outright to be made glamorous shaped by your polymathic brilliance you bi-weekly psychoanalyst first stop before funeral before wedding and block party alike you soothsayer cooing children to calm as they sit in the chair for the first time as still a storm as one might reasonably expect you ethicist defending hairlines at all cost your vigilance keeping online and otherwise slander at bay philosopher king thesaurus in the drawer dominoes and scotch and barbasol adorning your countertop right above the chorus line of clippers swaying to the clamor of checkmates and offhand insults now filling the shop each moving as if the unfettered locks of some great metal monster, some faraway watcher, and you, guardian of it all, clean as a pope. All right, a couple more. I've been writing a long time. This is so much fun. All right, so we got another poem about hair, which makes sense for a Black childhood event, I think, because childhood is at least one of the spaces in which it makes sense especially as a black child of your relationship to your hair. So part of the reason I have a beard this length and that I grew my hair out like this is because for my entire childhood, I wanted to and wasn't allowed to. And uh, one day I woke up and was 25 and realized I had no idea what my hair looked like. So I figured I would go for it. Something else I was not allowed to do was wear do-rags outside of the house. So this is a poem that is both about my uh, refusal <laughs> of that rule as a young person, but it's also about a piece of writing I came across, I wanna say now maybe six years ago, that was about Do-Rag History Month. And for those of you who are not familiar with, you know, a holiday celebrating Do-Rag history, that's because it doesn't exist as a formal institution, but this writer did not know that. Uh, it is an inside joke, as some of you may know with people on Twitter, and uh, where, you know, it'll be Moses in a Do-Rag, Harriet Tubman in a Do-Rag, et cetera, right? Uh, but reading that, that article, and just thinking about what goes into that kind of deep, hilarious misunderstanding, it prompted me to write this poem. So this is a ode, O-W-E-D, to the do-rag, which I spelled D-U-R-A-G, that's important, okay. Ode to the do-rag, which I spelled that way, D-U-R-A-G, because that's the way it was spelled on all the clear plastic packets I grew up buying for no more than $2, $2.50 max, unless I was at Dwayne Reed or some likewise corporatized venue. But who buys the majority of their do-rags at Dwayne Reed anyway? Who would actually wage war on the do-rag's good name by spelling it D-E-W hyphen R-A-G, as I recently read some sad lost souls do in an article in The Guardian, This Isn't Botany. This isn't a device one might use to attend to the suburban garden and its unremarkable flora, drying freshly damp wisteria with black silk or the much more common nylon rayon cotton blend. I could see D-O hyphen R-A-G. That works for me. One could argue this version makes more sense even than the spelling I am accustomed to, reflective as it is of nothing other than itself. I have never heard the term do used in a sentence by anyone other than a long lost colleague at Princeton who once reached wide eye for my high top fade before a swift rebuke marked by my striking his wrist, true story, as if some large though distinctly non-lethal mosquito, surely a top six proudest moment of anti-colonial choreography I have dared call mine in this odd and probable life I hold to my chest like a weapon. I know, I know. This wasn't supposed to be about them. You make me inordinately beautiful. Let's talk about that. Or how I'm 12 years old and the cape of a white do-rag billows from beneath my Marlin's cap like a sham poltergeist. Flight and failure contained within a single body, worthy core of any early 2000s era New York rapper's coat of arms. I was lying before, once, while we sat, quiet as mourners on the front porch, my father spat. That's a nice do you have there, eyeing the soft mess of corkscrew darkness atop his second youngest son's aging face, 
no sign of the good hair he praised for years to family and co-workers alike. Alas, old friend, you somehow make me even more opaque, make me mystery, criminal, dope boy by the corner of Broadway and 127th, compelling respectable people to reach for smartphones, call for backup, my smooth, adjustable shadow. Like policy or fire, you blacken everything you touch. All right. All right, we're doing all right. So one more before we pivot to the poems from uh, the study of human life, and then one from June, and then uh, a quick one for me, and we'll get out of here. So did anyone else grow up with plastic on a couch? At your auntie's house, grandma's house? Okay, we're on Zoom, so it's difficult for you all to chime in. I grew up with that. So this is uh, for everyone who grew up with plastic on the couch and uh, the kind of preservationist impulse, I think, is behind that, right? That that desire to keep something beautiful uh, for as long as possible, you know? But it's brutal in the summer to sit on a couch with plastic on it. It's genuinely painful, but I want us to linger with the celebration for a bit. So this is an uh, ode to the plastic on your grandmother's couch, which could almost be said to glisten or glow like the weaponry in heaven, frictionless, as if slickened with some Pentecostal auntie's last bottle of anointing oil, an ark of no covenant one might easily name, apart from the promise to preserve all small and distinctly mortal forms of loveliness that any elder African-American woman makes the day they see 60. Consider the garden of collards and heirloom tomatoes only, her long single braid streaked with gray like a gathering of weather, the child popped in church for not sitting still. How even that, they say, can become an omen if you aren't careful. If you don't act like you know, all Newton's laws don't apply to us the same exactly. Ain't no equal and opposite reaction to the everyday broad blackness in America is. No body so beloved, it cannot be destroyed. So we hold onto what we cannot hold. Adorn it in Vaseline or gold or polyurethane wrapping. Call it ours and don't mean owned. Call it just like new, mean, alive. All right, got about five more minutes, I think, yeah? So I read two short ones before a poem about my dad. So this is a poem for my son, August Galileo, who, uh, who changed everything for me. It's also about my grandmother who passed at the top of the pandemic and who created an environment in her South Bronx apartment on Christmas where all the children had to perform. Uh, but in you know, her democratic spirit, you could perform whatever you wanted. Like you could perform a Bible verse, you could perform a poem or a song, that Bobby Brown choreo you just memorized, you could just do it right then and there. And uh, it's hard for me to imagine that I'd be a poet or scholar or a person who loves beauty without my grandmother, Charlotte Elizabeth Ballard, may she rest. So this is a poem for her. Uh, it's also about becoming a parent in a pandemic. Uh, I wasn't allowed to go to my son's first three ultrasounds. And uh, by the second one, my wife and I got savvy and snuck a cell phone into the room. So I was able to see him you know, from a distance and connect that way. So this poem is commemorating that. It's called Dad Poem, Ultrasound Number Two with a line from Gwendolyn Brooks. Months into the plague now, I'm disallowed entry even into the waiting room with mom. Escorted outside instead by men armed only with guns and bottles of hand sanitizer, their entire countenance, its own American metaphor. So the first time I see you in full force, I am pacing maniacally up and down the block outside. FaceTiming the radiologist and your mother too, her arm angled like a cellist to help me see. We are dazzled by the sight of each bone in your feet, the pulsing black archipelago of your heart, your fists in front of your face like mine when I was only just born, 10 times as big as you are now. Your great grandmother calls me Tyson the moment she sees this pose, prefigures a boy built for conflict her barbarous and metal little man. 
She leaves the world only months after we learn you are entering into it. In her mind, the year before that. In the dementia's final days, she envisions herself as a girl of 17, running through fields of strawberries, unfettered as a kingfisher. I watch her stance and imagine her laughter echoing back across the ages you, her youngest descendant born into freedom, our littlest burden lifter, world beater, avant-garde percussionist, swinging darkness into song. This is a poem that June Jordan wrote for Forbes magazine, if you could believe such a thing. And it's about financial planning, which is definitely a part of becoming a parent. And uh, something I've thought about a lot, but uh, in ways that, don't, that feel wonderful to me, actually, thinking about what it means to always be trying to set something aside for this uh, small, wonderful person who also has my face and is now running around the house. So this is Financial Planning, commissioned by Forbes magazine. 50 cents more an hour would get me a house in the country. Hilarious friends calling an Airedale that wakes me up only for brunch. A lover lusting insatiate. Liberation from my own daily routines. 10,000 more a year would get me in debt for the house in the country. Part of the car that will slide up the driveway. Tennis lessons in the neighborhood. Installment plan travel out of that neighborhood entirely. An A1 recommended kennel for my dog. 50,000 beyond that would get me a whole lot of trouble. I'm sure. For example, I would have to revise this poem. And I don't know how. Sheesh. Do you know how to end a poem for sure? And this is my last poem. It's, uh, it's from my father and uh, about his childhood and what he had to survive to be the man who raised me. Thank you all for being such an incredible collective here with me today. And I'm excited to hear everyone else read. America will be after Langston Hughes. I'm now at the age where my father calls me brother when we say goodbye. Take care of yourself, brother. He whispers a half beat before we hang up the phone. And it's as if some great bridge has unfolded over the air between us. He is 68 years old. He was born in the throat of Jim Crow, Alabama, one of 10 children, their bodies side by side in the kitchen each morning, like a pair of hands exalting. Over breakfast, I asked him to tell me the hardest thing about going to school back then, expecting a history I've already memorized. Boycotts and attack dogs, fire hoses, Bull Connor in his personal tank, candy paint shining white as a Confederate ghost. He says, honestly, probably having to read the Canterbury Tales. He says, eating lunch alone. Now I hear the word America and think first of my father's loneliness, of the hands holding the pens that stabbed him as he walked through the hallway, unclenched palms settling onto a wooden desk, taking notes, trying to pretend the shame didn't feel like an inheritance you say, democracy. And I see the men holding documents that sent him off to war a year later, Motown blaring from a country boy's bunker as napalm scarred the sky into jigsaw patterns. His eyes opened wide as the blooming blue heart of the light bulb in a Crown Heights basement where he and my mother will dance for the first time. Their bodies swaying like rockets in the impossible dark. And yes, I know this is more than likely not what you mean when you sing liberty, but it is the only kind I know or can readily claim. The times where those hunted by history are underground and somehow still daring to love what they cannot hold or fully fathom when a stranger is not a threat but the promise of a different ending. I woke up this morning and there were men on television plotting a wall big enough to box out an entire world. Families torn with the stroke of a pen, the right to live little more than some garment that can be stolen or reduced to cinder at a tyrant's whim. My father knows this, grew up knowing this, witnessed firsthand the firebomb 
bombs, the clan, multiple messiahs, love soaked and shot through, somehow still believes in this grand blood-stained experiment, still votes, still prays that his children might make a life unlike any he has ever seen. He looks at me like the promise of another cosmos. And I never know what to tell him. All of the books in my head have made me cynical and distant, but there's a choir in him that calls me forward. My disbelief, built as it is from the bricks of his belief, not in any America you might see on network news or hear heralded before the start of a football game, but in the quiet power of Sam Cooke singing that he was born by a river that remains unnamed, that he runs alongside to this day, some vast and future country, some nation within a nation, black as candor, loud as the sound of my father's unfettered laughter over cheese eggs and coffee, his eyes shut tight as armories, his fists finally unclenched as if he were invincible. Thank you. Joshua, it feels like such an amazing thing um, to get to hear those poems in your voice, that just everything. Um, I want to start out by reading a couple of pieces of writing by June Jordan. Um, the first like Re, I'm in love with that memoir, Soldier, A Poet's Childhood. So I'm gonna share a tiny piece from that memoir, a different piece. Um, this is a point where she's talking about being a really little tiny girl um, and living in the projects in Harlem before her family moved to Brooklyn. So here is June Jordan writing about that, that really early childhood memory, quote. When he went away to work, when my father left my mother and me alone, I was allowed to indulge my more solitary inclinations. My mother would position a zinc tub on the sloping lawn behind our apartment. She'd attach a toy laundry wringer, fill that tub halfway with water, and bring me a pile of doll's clothes to wash and wring dry. This was bliss. She'd leave me there. My father would not suddenly appear and beat or threaten me with the strap. Nobody bothered me. I could splash and play, bemused by the creamy iridescence of soap flake spray. I could contemplate the watery reflections of so many no longer definite things. My face or the drastic attenuation of an overhead branch. And meanwhile, I was washing my clothes. I never wearied of this make-believe. And it was only partly not true. Yes, the clothes were not dirty for starters. And yes, I never got around to rinsing out the soap, but other than that, I was really washing clothes. And when I lifted my eyes from the tub, or if I looked beyond the handle of the ringer, I could always see the Harlem River, always bright and sliding along, end quote. Um, part of why this childhood memory, right? June Jordan's childhood memory of washing the doll clothes stayed so magical, I think, was that Jordan's parents didn't want her to do any housework when she was a kid. Her job was to study, right? Her job was also to be a fighter. Her job was to get good grades. It was not to cook food or clean anything and certainly, you know, not to wash laundry. Um, so um, now I'm gonna read a June Jordan poem about being a grown up and washing clothes. Um, it's called, It's Hard to Keep a Clean Shirt Clean. And Jordan dedicated it to Sriram Shamasunder and all, of, and all of poetry for the people. So here's Jordan's poem. It's hard to keep a clean shirt clean. It's a sunlit morning with jasmine blooming easily and a drove of robin red breasts diving into the ivy covering what used to be a backyard fence where doves shoving aside the birch tree leaves when a young man walks among the flowers to my doorway where he knocks, then stands still, brilliant in a clean white shirt. He lifts a soft fist to that door and knocks again. He's come to say this was or that was not and what's any one of us to do about what's done, what's past, but prickling salt to sting our eyes. What's any one of us to do about what's done? And seven-month-old Bingo, puppy leaps and hits that clean white shirt with muddy paw prints here and here and there. And what's any one of us to do about what's done? I say, I'll wash the shirt, no problem. 
Two times through the delicate blue cycle of an old machine, the shirt spins in the soapy suds and spins and rinse and spins and spins out dry, not clean, still marked by accidents, by energy of whatever serious or trifling cause, the shirt stays dirty from that puppy's paws. I take that fine white shirt from India, the threads as soft as baby fingers weaving them together, and I wash that shirt between, between the knuckles of my own two hands. I scrub and rub that shirt to take the dirty markings out at the pocket and around the shoulder seam and on both sleeves, the dirt, the paw prints tantalize my soap, my water, my sweat, equity invested in the restoration of a clean white shirt. And on the 11th try, I see no more, no anything unfortunate, no dirt. I hold the limp fine cloth between the faucet stream of water as transparent as a wish the moon stayed out all day. How small it has become, that clean white shirt. How delicate, how slight, how like a soft fist knocking on my door. And now I hang the shirt to dry as slowly as it needs the air to work its way with everything. It's clean, a clean white shirt nobody wanted to spoil or soil. That shirt much cleaner now, but also not the same as the first before that shirt got hit, got hurt, not perfect anymore, just beautiful. A clean white shirt. It's hard to keep a clean shirt clean. Yeah, what you said, Joshua, about June Jordan knowing how to end a poem. I don't know where that magic came from. Um, yeah. So um, growing up, right, Black feminist writers were so incredibly important to me. Um, I had this mildewy smelling copy of Paula Giddings' book, uh, book, When and Where I Enter. I got it from this used bookstore and I read and reread it until it was dog-eared. And that pointed me to a whole bunch of other scholars and authors. Um, historians mattered to me, right? Black feminist historians mattered to me. But the poets were my real heroes back then when I was a little bitty and a not so little bitty. Um, poets like June Jordan, especially, um, who were talking about identity in really complex ways about the intersections of race and class and gender and sexuality. Those were my essential reading. Um, those poets were like air and water. They helped me figure out how to navigate the world and they gave me hope for the future. Um, so the poems of my own that I'm gonna to read today are about what it was like to grow up as part of a very tiny black community in Eugene, Oregon, um, during the height of the Aryan youth movement in the Pacific Northwest. So Nikki, your work talks about the adultification of young black girls. Um, one of the ways that I experienced that adultification firsthand was in my friendships. Um, my high school sweetheart, Robin, was white and he was an aspiring farmer, which meant that his jobs, right, um, sharing sheep, working on logging crews, were often really contingent on dealing with some virulently racist people. At one point, his boss was a member of the Brownsville KKK and they'd argue about politics all the time. Um, Robin got his GED and then he left the country to work first in Nova Scotia and then in Australia and then in New Zealand, um, in part because he wanted to see if there was any place in the world that would be welcoming to us as a young biracial couple, because Oregon certainly wasn't. Um, in a letter, uh, looking back on that time, he wrote that although officially he traveled with a US passport, he actually traveled on a white passport. The racism and the violence that we experienced and that we were threatened with all the time in Oregon back then was utterly adultifying for both of us. And it was also too much to throw at a couple of kids. So um, these poems that I'm gonna read, gosh, they were hard to write. It took me years, four years to like write and revise these poems. Um, I'm gonna read them, they're about that time. They are among my Pacific Northwest stories about Black childhood. Um, the first poem I'm gonna share is called The Subjunctive. In high school, we learned the subjunctive in French and how to cut open a leopard frog. Some weekends, his dad would drive to Bodie to eat steak and listen to the music. We'd meet at the trailhead with our flashlights off to braille our way down to the water. With gravel in a shin, 
and more gravel in a palm. We propped our mag lights on the rocks, tilted their beams modestly down. I wish she wouldn't drink so much, he said. If it was summer, small whirlwinds that smelled like clary sage would kick sand on us. In winter, less talk. I'd pull his cold hands between my thighs, scan the sky for satellites until our teeth stopped chattering. On Wednesdays, we broke into the old garage, piled high with broken desks and broken chairs, ate sweaty chocolate and read Lee Poe on a six foot stack of wrestling mats. He said the whole world was in a single room. My locker had pictures of Paris and Santa Fe. And when Madame Bach asked us to translate before I go away, it's necessary that I say this. Je t'aime, he wrote in the blank, mais je dois partir. I wish I knew then what I know now. World without end, world endlessly repeating. Somehow we're still heaving ourselves out of dark water, gasping like beached fish, our clothes in a heap. Nine safety pins holding my skirt hem like courtiers. A pistol. Sometimes I thought of slaughter of Demeter making winter, that season's angular momentum like stones flying through the air. Sometimes I thought I would die, like when I washed my car and the soap streaks on the windshield looked like the backwash of stars above the barn. For a while, we made a game of it, cut body parts from magazines and reassembled them into cyborgs, gave each one a name and a mantra. We filled notebooks and finished each other's sentences. How do I love thee? I said I wouldn't. Like a lug nut in a junkyard, you said. The redneck who almost ran us off the road, he was force. Your elbow the angle as the wheel spun. And after, distance was the furrow our tires had cut into the road's shoulder. Also, the wrinkle between your eyebrows as you blinked hard and didn't say, I just wanted you to feel how soft a lamb's ear is. And I didn't say, what's the use of coming home to this? For a while, we made a game of it. I ducked when we passed through small towns, ducked when we saw another truck. When that got old, I put my head in your lap. Eyes closed, your quadricep was a wood pillow in a museum case next to the bowls and jade ornaments. This next poem is called Synecdoche, and it's after the literary device where a part of something stands in for the whole thing, like saying sail to stand in for a ship. Um, I was thinking about what one part of the past could stand in for the whole story of that particular teenage relationship. Um, and this is this poem is what I came up with. Um, a quick content warning here. I have to say there are curse words in this poem. Um, because it features the hypotheticals game where you give someone three names and then they have to say which one they'd kill, which one they'd hook up with and which one they'd marry um, using slightly more blunt language. Uh, yeah, so there it is. Here's Synecdoche. At the edge of the field, the wind makes the tall grass ripple like water. It makes my heart swing like a willow switch. My heart, that constant little bitch that swam in tea leaves at the bottom of your cup poured honey onto the snow and fed you by the spoonful. Fifteen and cross-legged on your floor, my heart asked, Artemis, Cassandra, Clytemnestra, kill fucker Mary. Later, we parked at the top of a hill, traced our initials into the wet smear of city lights on the windshield. For an hour, just listened to the rain. Then, naiad, dryad, minotaur, you said, kill fucker Mary and my heart drilled itself full of wells. All of the droplets were fat blue commas. Um, this next poem I'm gonna read is in the form of a prayer. It's called Litany. Virgin conceived far away from here, pray for us, who nonetheless knows too much about deserts, pray for us, and planets that crest the night sky like ships, pray for us, and plants shaped like cups, the perpetual wish for water, pray for us. Virgin, who probably walked a lot, pray for us, and found on the ground all manner of things, pray for us. Arrowheads, 
mica, dried up lizards, pray for us, while jackrabbits spied and bolted away, pray for us, basin of the world, hope of track stars, pray for us, recourse of loners, rivulet from stone, pray for us, who probably cries when they use the n-word, pray for us, who probably knows what it is to feel broken, pray for us, even sometimes by the little things, pray for us, a hole in a shoe, a marigold that died, pray for us, defender of children, bastion of clarity, pray for us, star in the already starry night sky. So um, the next poem I wanna share with y'all is a contrapuntal. It's a very new poetic form, even though it's an old musical form, it takes its inspiration from a musical contrapuntal where you have two or more independent melodic lines and they're existing simultaneously. So um, on the page, my contrapuntal is in two columns and it can be read both down and across. So I'm gonna read it both ways. One of my students wrote a triple contrapuntal one time that just blew my mind. And I was like, how did you do that? Like what, I don't even know. Um, so yeah, people, poets are like making these amazing, amazing things in this new form. Um, this one's called So Many Variables. Were I more patient, I'd understand the language of birds, absolution around which all things converge. All things converge like aspen against the sky, and maybe it's a metaphor. Remember that time in the truck bed, I'd call it beauty, the world's primary colors. I'd understand the impossible moon calf self, dense, invasive between the teeth, like the, like the tongue, like declension, the heart between hammers, when you woke me up by laughing. Were I more patient, I'd call it beauty. I'd understand the world's primary colors, the language of birds. I'd understand absolution, the impossible moon calf self around which dense, invasive, all things converge. Between the teeth, all things converge, like the tongue, like aspen against the sky, like declension. And maybe it's a metaphor, the heart between hammers. Remember that time in the truck bed when you woke me up by laughing. Um, this next poem also has a curse word in it. Sorry, I feel a little bit, <laughs> yeah, like Anne of Green Gables here. Um, nobody ever gives Anne of Green Gables credit for all the time she wants to talk, but she doesn't. If all y'all knew how all the F-bombs I wanted to put in my poem, but didn't, because uh, I'm trying to be proper. Uh, this one was unavoidable. This one's called God of Lambs You Take Away. One time a white boy asked me to use a bull whip on him. Don't insult me, I said, I am the motherfucking whip. Maybe you guessed that I hurt so deep down bad it'll never carve out, not even when I'm dead. Because you are to me as grass is to hillside, I sing a lullaby of 50 cent words about war. I make hegemony sound like a sweet thing growing near the edge of a creek. And because that chapter keeps me up nights, thinking of hawthorns, have mercy, because pine is a symbol of paradise. One time, a white boy asked me to unpleat my skirt, to unstave all the plants, and the loud air conditioner bespoke tact and was a symbol of diaspora and occasional tobacco and echolocation, just as the space shuttle framed over the bed was a symbol of autonomy. And I said, tell me where you rest lest I be found wandering after the flocks of your companions. Tempera plus mores. When I was a child, I talked like a man. I reasoned like a mirror. We shall see face to face, I reasoned. I gained nothing. No, I gained footholds and some vistas, the parts of mountains now clanging like brass. Say I wandered burned and salted the fields, say I threatened, all the water dammed, all the cover crops left to rabbits, and in the crosshairs, grazing rights and egress. When I talked, you see, I put the mirror behind me. My tongue had symbols, but it did not have you, and therefore I was nothing. Say I became a combine and could sway the grass. Say I knew rabbits and angels, and when I walked, the fields opened like books with broken spines. Minds. Say too that I remained like a child. Now I know, I thought, 
if I speak of calibration, it's because when I moved, you were before and behind and all around me, and you were not. And regarding prophecy, I did not gain the world. I wondered. I threatened to give my body, and I gave it. How quiet and unfathomable it all was. Um, the last poem I'll read today is called Deus Plus Machina, and it has a reference to a song called Bone Machine by the Pixies off the amazing Surfer Rosa album. So here's Deus Plus Machina. Little gearbox, little hole in the metal, denizen, little connected to, your, tra your chain trailing, throwing sparks, your bones a machine. Tell me something about heaven. I see you bailing, I see you twining things around other things, and in season, burning whole sections of dried grass on overcast mornings, all the smoke drifts across the highway like a wide equation, hands full of the smell of kerosene, mind elsewhere, made mirror, splinter, spy, road, field, gray, no difference, bitter air, such apothecary clarity. Hey y'all, thank you for listening. Now we get to hear from Re, hear from Nikki. Thank you so much, Chai. Thank you, Josh. Wow. Your poems are so moving and so rich um, with new ways of understanding and relating to our Black childhood. So thank y'all so much for sharing. Before we dive into our questions, thank you, Nikki, for dropping that in the chat. We just want to encourage y'all to please write your questions for our wonderful poets in the Q&A feature. We would love to hear from y'all as well. My first question is about your relationship to your own Black childhood self. So you both explore these remnants of childhood in your writing. And I'm wondering if you can introduce your Black childhood self, if you can tell us a little more about them, who they were, what did they love, what did they dream of? And also, how did that Black child and the communities that raised that Black child shape the grown Black human that you are today? Hey, Joshua, you want to go first? Sure, I could try. That's such a, a beautiful question and a heavy one. I mean, I'm trying to even think what dreams and fears I have that I at least don't see the trace of from that time, right? I mean, I what did I want to be? I mean, I dreamed of being a paleontologist and a preacher. And then when I was 17 years old, someone gave me a copy of Race Matters at Cornell West. I read that book multiple times. And I looked on the back. And I saw that he taught something called African-American studies. And I was astonished that such a thing existed. And I said, I'm going to major in African-American studies, which I did when I got to college. And I also decided I wanted to be a professor of African-American studies, if at all possible. So, yeah, I mean, when I think about that time, I think about the family and family friends that would give teenage Joshua that kind of book. I think about the family that let me improvise sermons for 40 minutes after church when I was a four and five year old. <laughs> Right. I mean, they would do the amens. They would do the mm, they would do the whole thing. You know, they would gather around me. And I just always knew that um, it was OK to have something to say, to have a critical viewpoint and a perspective as a child. The idea that I was supposed to be silent or off to the corner, it just never really occurred to me. And I was just around beautiful, brilliant black people all the time. I went to an all black school founded by a Mildred Johnson, you know, James Weldon Johnson's niece called the Modern School. And so the first national anthem I ever heard was, you know, wasn't the Star Spangled Banner, I'll tell you that. It was Lift Every Voice and Sing. I didn't hear the Star Spangled Banner until I was older. And my first thought was, this doesn't even slap. So, yeah, I'll, I'll say, you know, the, the community <laughs> that raised me, raised me to, to love Blackness and see myself as a full human being. And that, that's why it shows up in the poetry so much. You know, it's, it's the source I return to for meaning and, uh, and for beauty and power, you know, especially if I feel stuck. I just sort of sit and think about the, the narratives that have traveled through me. And, uh, and I'll stop here. The, the people that, that kept me safe, you know, that loved me enough to, to look after me. And they weren't all my blood kin. You know, these are people from the block who, when I was coming home from school, made sure I didn't get jumped or robbed. 
I mean, that that's a certain kind of kinship relation that I don't want to take for granted. So yeah, man, I was, I was loved and I'm, I'm thankful for that. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Right. Like you're making me think, Joshua, I'm like, what did I want to do? I mean, I, 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 so yeah, I remember seeing like an early video, right. Before there were music videos of Lakeside singing fantastic voyage. And like one of the dudes in the video is wearing this gold lame pirate suit. And I was like, that's what I want. Like when I grow up, I'm going to wear a gold lame pirate suit to work. Right. And I have still not achieved that childhood ambition um a little bit later on when I got to go to museums and understood that docents was like that was a thing people did I was like I want to be a docent but I want to wear really cool shoes when I do it right so I had these kinds of early ambitions I'm thinking like when I was tiny what was I what was I thinking about um I found childhood really beautiful and intriguing um, and also really terrifying. I was so ready to be grown up because I hated the vulnerability. Um, one of the things that I struggled with a lot that was really hard is, um, you know, my, my parents um, struggling with substance abuse, you know, and that made a lot of things feel really precarious for parts of, parts of childhood. Um, and yeah, so it's just, yeah, I'm thinking like who you were, you know, who you loved and what you loved, um, what did you dream of, all of these things. Um, I was lucky because I was around a lot of artists and makers too. That's another thing that shaped my childhood. Um, I was raised by these kind of crazy hippie black nationalist poet, you know, like folks who um, were makers. My mom is an upholsterer, you know, she recovered furniture. Like she learned, she did a training program to learn how to do that. And she was the only woman who was in that training program, she said she didn't want to be a secretary. She couldn't type particularly well. Um, I feel like I inherited that inability to type as well from her. Um, but yeah, so I, I saw people um, who were craftspeople. There were a lot of musicians and artists and activists. Um, my parents were, were activists. That shaped my worldview. When June Jordan in Soldier writes about, when she wrote about, um, having, you know, like the other, the additional, the, the forced, enforced enlightenment, you know, her dad's extracurriculum. I'm like, yeah, I had that too. So um, I kind of resented it as a little bitty person sometimes, uh, but also I read everything. I read the, all, like everything that no one in my predominantly white schools was assigning, you know, um, I would come home like one time I, I came home and I called my dad to tell him, you know, we got a book, this book review assignment and I'm really book report assignment. I'm really nervous about it. And he was like, why don't you read Malcolm X's autobiography and write about that? And then you can give that presentation, right? 11. And y'all know y'all have read this, you know, that there's some stuff that probably 11 year olds shouldn't be reading in that book. I was utterly fascinated that maybe that sums up like what my childhood was about wandering around in the, in the fields, playing outside, you know, playing in the woods, doing all that stuff. And then coming back to like read June Jordan's poetry or read Maya Angelou's poetry. And, you know, just, I don't know, sneak extra cookies from the top of the refrigerator, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. Thank you so much, Chai. Joss, did you want to add anything else? I was just gonna ask, were the cookies in that blue tin? Y'all know the kind of Danish cookies with the Rito that I'm talking about. The classic There's cookies. a okay. Yeah, but see, because I was a hippie kid, there were those ones. And then the trick was to figure out which one of the cookies you were supposed to get because some of them had weed in them, right? And so it shouldn't be like taking the wrong cookies. So it's like you get those, like all kinds of terrible things happen. Yeah. So black childhoods. Like Perfect. trying to not eat the pot brownies, you know, trying to figure out which ones are which. That's hilarious. Thank y'all so much. <laughs> so wonderful to be introduced to little Josh and little Chai and uh, <laughs> definitely relate to the, the sermons. That was me at five years old, uh, curating multiple sermons for the family. So thank you, Josh, for sharing that. I'm also wondering how y'all believe that Blackness complicates the category of childhood. Chai, you already talked about some adultification 
Um, I'm wondering how this shows up in your life and in your writing and how grown Black folks today might reconnect with certain remnants of our childhood, maybe parts that we weren't able to experience because of adultification and how that can enhance our writing process. Also wondering what are the tools that y'all use to connect with younger parts of yourself in your writing process and how do this sort of memory work enhance your writing across projects? Maybe even if it's not you writing on Black childhood, how connecting with your Black childhood uh, serves as a source of imagination, creativity, and memory work uh, for the other writing that you do. May I say one tiny thing quickly about this? So one of the reasons why I brought in those two particular, like why I wanted to share those two particular pieces of June Jordan's work is that I think that um, we, one of the strengths, like one of the tools that we have that maybe we don't know we have is a rep repository of associations, right? Maybe it's not conscious or something, but consciously on our mind, like how we feel about washing clothes or something that that comes from our childhood experiences. But um, when images, when particular symbols, particular nouns like keep showing up in the work, right? Um, to trust the power of the feelings and the associations, right? That that I think is something that's like, you know, that's that's one of some of the tools like to stay connected and to be or to reconnect in a deep way, like to childhood is to trust, kind of trust where you're going, even if you don't know where you're going when it first first hits the page. Um, Re, I mean, you're right. Blackness does complicate the category of childhood, right? Um, having to, I mean, I just keep thinking also, I mean, um, all of those amazing works of literature where we have ancestors, right? Telling us their own experiences of just being like, oh, wow, here I am, you know, a little W.E.B. Du Bois. And I'm like, oh, wow, this little girl didn't want my calling card. And it's because I'm black and what is that? And now I've got to make sense of that, right? Like we've got, we've got these ancestors who are helping us navigate that. I mean, that for me, um, I feel like I can't separate my own and would never want to separate like my experience of, of walking through childhood, having that experience, trying to figure out racialization, racialization and blackness, like without ancestors and also without contemporaries. I mean, Joshua, I mean, you, you, um, I was so happy that you started out with Token Sings the Blues, right? <laughs> because, you know, like when you're thinking about this, like about the, th there are these lines from that about, um, just about like what it is like um, to, you know, you're always the only one in the room, <laughs> like, and how threatening, like people, you know, people find that, you know three is, wow, there's so many of you kind of things. I mean, um, when I was a, when I was a teenager, um, well, okay. So this is a weird way of saying it. I'm being really wordy and, you know, verbose about this, but like to draw on those memories and sometimes the things that are actually really painful from childhood and put them on the page, right? Like channel that and work them out and see, learn something from them, like through language, um, in high school, there were at a school of about, I guess it was about 1700 kids by the time I was a senior, right? So that was a really big, big group of kids at that point. There were about a, a large influx, which means there were about 20, 25 black kids in the school that year. Um, three of the girls used, you know, those iron on puffy letters, right? Like if they made these t-shirts, matching t-shirts that said OG homegirl and the administration of the school, like the principal who I loved, who was just this really great, like crazy person who always wore purple all the time to match our school colors, um, freaked out and called every black child in that school into the office to interrogate us about whether there was some, there was actually a gang, right? Like they really freaked out, that kind of thing. That's what you channel in the poems, right? Like you take those moments where your child self sort of understood or kind of understood what was going on, but didn't entirely. And like you put it on the page and try to figure it out. That's, that's where I go. That's where I want to go with that. With like, how does blackness complicate the category of childhood? And now I, I totally want to hear Joshua, what you have to say about this question. Cause it's such a great question. Fantastic question. That is a beautiful answer. It take all the time you need to work through that thing. Uh, Thank yeah. you, fam. <laughs> uh -huh. I said, thank you, fam. Oh, yeah, yeah, I got you. I got you. Um, I mean, yeah, vulnerability to various kinds of 
state violence on the one hand. So just to think about school, I remember we literally had a bus driver named Mr. White, who when we acted up, he would call the police on us and the police would come on the bus. <laughs> and the, I mean- That's I, real? That isn't just in the poem? Oh no, oh yeah, so the, right, this is in the poetry. No, 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 he would call the police. Yeah. Okay. The police would come on the bus and tell us what happened to children like us if they didn't eventually learn to behave, which was prison, right? Death or prison. Yeah. So that was, that was in the landscape of my childhood imaginary, you know, kind of like early death. My, my older brother was also locked up, right? So the threat of incarceration was always sort of right there. And the idea that you could be killed with impunity, this is just something I thought about growing up in New York as a black child um, in the 90s. And uh, yeah, that's all over the poetry, but I think it's, it's all over my life now as a writer and as a professional. And as a parent, I mean, there's, there's part of me in the back of my head that that's almost like surprised, you know, that I'm still alive in a, in a strange way. Like I didn't, I don't know that I really mapped it out this far. Like I knew I wanted to be a professor, I wrote these books, wanted to come up for tenure. I had that stuff written down at least, but I think at every single step, there was a real sense of surprise. Like, oh, wow, I'm still, I'm still here. This is, this is incredible. I, I, I get to do this part. Um, that's complicated. I also think, I also think having a, a child is, is the first time in my life I'm scared to die. You know, I, I think earlier I kind of understood that it happens for, for no reason to all sorts of people. You walk outside, there's Hennessy altars on the ground. There are kids, you know, that maybe you've never met on people's t-shirts. And that's just, that's part of black social life and then the part of the, the city I grew up in. And, um, to want to like stay here it, and like for this person to like teach them to do things and just be around and see them grow up that that's a slightly surreal feeling and it's it's something I don't hear a lot of people talk about in public necessarily so I just wanted to give voice to that uh going back to the childhood space in terms of imagination I love that I get to teach poetry to children I mean it's it's what I did to feed myself before I was a professor or before I had you know university healthcare, which is solid I was on tour, I've been on tour for 13 years, and I've always taught in colleges and high schools, but also elementary schools. So I've taught children as young as five years old, you know, I've done spoken word workshops for kindergartners. And that has been some of the more life-affirming work of my life, right? Is to, to hear the children recite their own stuff, but also listen to their, their sense of image. I mean, it, it really is quite incredible. I know writers talk about this, but you sit in a workshop for a couple of hours with students, you know, age five to 11, you'll just hear horses in particular do all sorts of things. You never thought of, you know, horses are the ocean, horses, <laughs> horses take flight in terms of the cubes in the sky. I mean, it's just very interesting ways of thinking about sort of matter and, and mentation. And uh, even in learning to play with my son, I mean, it's, it's just opened up a new door in my brain because I'd figure out how to do that 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 wasn't a skill set that I'd honed in graduate school. You know, I didn't, I came into this process and was like, okay, I have to be a tiger now for maybe the next 20 minutes. I have to be a tiger with you because you want daddy to be a tiger. And that, that has been psychologically and emotionally liberating for me to just have to say, I don't know what to do. I have very little control. And this one-year-old is going to guide our activities for this window of time in which I will have to transform and be silly and, like make mistakes and it's, um, yeah, it's, it's just taught me so much about what the poetry can be and what it can mean, um, especially in practice. And I think June Jordan taught me that, you know, years ago on the page, right? That even before it was poetry for the people, it was voices of the children, right? In the early seventies and it was in Harlem and Brooklyn and it was for black and Puerto Rican kids at church at the open door, right? To me, this is a Mount Rushmore American essayist, world historical intellectual. Her practice starts with kids and poetry. So with that example and now living out, you know, this other part of June's life as a, as a parent, it's just putting those threads together has, has transformed everything for me. So powerful. Thank you. No, I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of County Cullen's children's book, The Lost mm -hmm. Zoo. Do you and have that? Right, right. Like oh, all the creatures. How I lost them. I got both. Hold on. Where is that thing? 
I'm gonna find it by the end. We'll pull out both copies. See, and it's a thing. Like I'd have to, I'd have to jump off camera to grab like Langston Hughes's book, um, Jazz, the musician. Like, like all of these greats, like all of these literary ancestors. Yeah, like writing things specifically for children and like things that that we, if we were really lucky, like we got to meet as children and then mm-hmm. later as people who are you know around and caregivers of children. Like it's just yeah, part of the tradition. So intensely important. W. E. B. Du Bois, right? Um, the Brownies book, right? You've got this, you know, and, and now I'm forgetting all the, the editors, the main editors, um, amazing black women writers who were working on that and, stu- and stewarding that, you know, Nella Larson writing Danish children's tales and children's games and tales, stuff like that. Um, yeah, so powerful. And, and Gwendolyn Brooks, right? With the Jump Bad yeah. anthology and, you know. Yeah. Script and it's just like, is where where is that? May, do we have time on the panel to talk about that? I just feel like we need to bring that that back because it seems like that was just in the atmosphere, right? It's like we're black, we're the foremost black poets at this moment, right? We have to have sort of public programs that are specifically catered to young people. We have to publish their work, and it needs to be a part of our, yeah. our practice. I just I, don't, I have a sense that we we need that that our young people desperately need that right now, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, one of the things in the chat, right? One of my colleagues, um, Professor David Kayu noted, you know, chatted as as someone doing research in Swahili children's literature, I'm gaining a lot from this panel discussion. I mean, I wish I could like bring David into the room and just be like, oh my gosh, tell us what you're working on. Like, what are you finding, right? I mean, I remember reading Jumbo Means Hello, right? Like this was part of my black childhood <laughs> was like, you need to learn Swahili. Like when I would talk to my plants to try to get them to like grow better, I, I would, I was just like, you're an African violet. Perhaps I should address you in Swahili. It is a trade language. You might know this. So I was like a little tiny person, like just like saying, I'm talking to my violets in the little Swahili that I learned from my children's book because my parents were those kind of activist hippies, right? You know, where they're like, you must learn this. <laughs> That's beautiful. I am loving this conversation. I know folks in the chat are, are, are as well. And this um, idea of, of what we learn from childhood, taking childhood seriously, uh, but playing and taking play seriously, um, you know, and, and the demands that children make of us um, and stepping into those demands, right? And so let's pretend as a choice at some point. And that's part of what June Jordan as asks us at some times and demands at other times that, that we pretend that this other world that we know exists is the world we all live in. Um, and so I'm just so inspired by this whole conversation. I do wanna get to a couple of questions in the chat because I know we are going to, to cut off at 1.30. Uh, and so there are two questions and I'm gonna, there are more than two questions asked, actually I'm gonna condense them and ask you to choose which one you want to respond to. One is, what advice do you have for people trying to write about painful histories, trying to turn trauma into beauty? And another uh, set of questions is about loneliness. In some ways, you know, we've, we've certainly talked about the joy and the pain of childhood, but this idea of loneliness, were either of you lonely as children, with or without siblings, and did it ever resurface in your childhood or, adult, or adulthood as anger, such that poetry became a channel of working through the anger? and or finding solutions to the causes of that distress. So those are the two, the two questions and we have just a couple of minutes uh, before we finish up here. Both of those questions are amazing. I'll talk about the loneliness piece. Yeah, I mean, that, that, was, so much of my, that was so much of my childhood. And I feel like, um, yeah, like how to look back on that, how to come back to that. Um, I think one of the things that I learned um, was how to transform loneliness into solitude. And I wouldn't have used those words as a little person, right? But um, I remember hearing about an experiment where people, like one of the the most difficult things apparently for humans to do is sit in a room by ourselves. Um, People would actually, if you're just sitting by yourself or you have the option of shock, giving yourself a mild shock, like using a little shock machine, like people would shock themselves. I think that sometimes the childhood loneliness is hard, as hard a thing that is to go through. If you make it through the other side to adulthood and you have a long relationship with loneliness, like you, even if like you have the possibility of transforming it into something, 
something that is actually really powerful and productive that um, that allows you to be quiet in your life when you need to be quiet. I'll, I'll let Joshua answer the questions now too, because I know we're short on time. That's an incredible answer. I'm gonna be honest, I don't think I was very lonely until adulthood in no small part because I was just in school from the time I was four to like age 28 or something. Like I just, I just didn't really take a break between pre-K and, and PhD at any point. And it was after I wasn't in school anymore that I needed to call on the resources of childhood to figure out how to make friends, right? Like I, I needed to figure out, okay, where is like the local chess club, right? Where, where are the people that want to start a reading group and say like, do you want to read with me, right? It's the it's the kindergarten question where it returned again, at least for me, because it felt like I needed a kind of sociality without the formal institution to provide it, if that makes sense. And I, I think I'd forgotten about how easy it was to make friends in school um, and the fact that I really needed that. So that was one way that I've tried to navigate, I guess, the loneliness of adulthood. Maybe some of this is having, you know, like five siblings. Like I just wasn't by myself that, that often. And when I was, it was like that Gwendolyn Brooks children's book, Aloneness. Like I, I found a kind of richness in my aloneness. I would sit with my big red Webster's dictionary and look up whatever words my mother refused to define because that was her pedagogical practice. Son, look it up, you know? So I would take that time to do that. And um, the story about how to turn a traumatic history into something beautiful, I mean, that's, that's complicated, right? I mean, that's one of the, the missions of the field perhaps, <laughs> right? The banner under which we, we've gathered today. And I mean, the answer I would have for that is, an answer that I think my Black studies professors have given me over the years, which is that it's something you do in community, right? You, you listen closely to the stories of those who come before you. And also, as Jordan reminds us, the children, because they come from the future, right? They're people who come from the future with another world in another way. So I'd say part of how you can make the thing beautiful is by bringing in other sounds and other colors, and you need other people to do that, right? I know we have a heroic vision of this country of just the writer at the desk kind of pounding away, but that's never worked for me. I've always needed other people to help bring the poems to life. So that's the advice I would give, you know, is to get out and live and find your people um, and let the work emerge from that space. Beautiful. Thank you both so much. This has been so inspiring. All of my little girl selves are just jumping with joy, feeling so seen and affirmed. So thank y'all for honoring your Black childhoods, for honoring June Jordan's Black childhood, and for sharing so many moving reflections with us. Thank you. Of course. Absolutely. Thank you for guiding us. And I share my, my thanks as, as well uh, to both of you today for the inspiration uh, and the beauty and the, the challenge uh, that I knew you were going to bring to us uh, through your work. Um, please, this is, as I shared at the top, the last in our series of, for this year. Uh, please do join us next year. We'll be celebrating the 25th uh, anniversary of our PhD program. Uh, and uh, we, so we hope to, to see you there. We'll have another outstanding uh, program for the year. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists um, through, who are here this year. We appreciate you. Thank you all for joining the conversation and for dwelling with us in the spirit and the legacy of June Jordan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye.